Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Green Bank um, Zoom community Zooms. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, four staff members will be going over their AAS talks. Welcome, everybody. Happy New Year. And just a reminder to everybody that the proposal 21B proposal call is out and the GBT proposal deadline is February 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jesse Bublitz, assuming everybody can hear it okay. So Jesse, you're up first. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let me get my screen up. All right, can everyone see me? Yes. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, so today I will be talking about um, the research that I'll be presenting at a um, astronomical conference next week, um, which focuses on uh, my radio observations of the nearby and rapidly evolving planetary nebula, NGC 7027. So um, a planetary nebula, in brief, is the late stage of a sun-like star um, having stopped fusion. Its outer layers uh, are thrown off um, into um, concentric shells of gas and dust while it's, the remaining core um, collapses and um, begins producing uh, high energy radiation, ultraviolet, and in the case of NGC 7027, X-rays. Um, so it has a very hot, bright central star um, and uh, in the past has been well studied in its molecular content. So um, my group has decided to try and observe uh, NGC 7027 um, in two molecules, CO plus and HCO plus, in order to try and understand how the ultraviolet and x-rays are affecting the chemistry and are driving the evolution of this object. To do this, we've used the um, Northern Extended Millimeter Array, which is a series of radio dishes in the French Alps in order to create a complete map, a full image of the nebula. So why do we choose CO plus and HCO plus? Well, effectively, there are several different um, chemical reactions that can produce these molecules. Um, effectively, through ultraviolet or through X-ray interactions. And in fact, there is one chemical reaction in the top right in which CO plus is converted into HCO plus. So by imaging both of these molecules, uh, we've hoped to try and compare their structure uh, because if the two molecules are formed by the same process, uh, we would expect them to be um, co-spatial, uh, roughly overlaying. But if they were formed by different processes, we would expect to see different structures in these molecules. So um, just our initial look at these two maps, we can already see there is some distinct differences in how the CO plus and the HCO plus are um, structured around this nebula. And if we take um, the outline of HCO plus and lay it on top of the CO plus map, as well as compare with a known um, ultraviolet radiation tracer, which is molecular hydrogen, and overlay those um, outlines onto CO plus, we can finally start to see the distinct difference in their structure. So on the left, we've got molecular hydrogen uh, outlining uh, outlines on top of CO plus, and they are a perfect fit. Um, see very much that same um, cloverleaf-like structure in CO plus as in molecular hydrogen, um, thus giving us reasonable certainty that CO plus is formed by ultraviolet photons. Conversely, on the right. Um, the outlines of HCO plus appear strikingly different than the CO plus image below it. Uh, not only do we have these um, outflows um, to the north or top and bottom 
of the image. But in the lower left hand corner, you also see a significant lack of emission of HCO plus, where there is clearly CO plus. Um, and finally, uh, around the middle of this uh, nebula, there are these two bright points, um, both in CO plus and HCO plus, which is sort of uh, like the waste of an hourglass. And um, however, it's quite apparent that the HCO plus is extended further from that star in the center. Um, and by observations, it's about uh, one arc second or uh, the distance from the Earth to the sun, um, that it is more extended. So from this, we can reasonably say that HCO plus, unlike CO plus, is in fact formed by X-rays. And we can even take this a step further, look at um, parts of the HCO plus. So the image on the left here shows um, uh, sections of the HCO plus observations um, in blue that are moving towards us or blue shifted and um, a component that is moving away from us or red shifted. And immediately you can see that the gas is uh, clumped, uh, focused in these particular outflows uh, around the edges of NGC 7027. Now these um, correlate really well with previous observations of uh, fast jets, uh, as well as X-ray emission. So what we're seeing here is confirmation that um, these fast winds or jets are uh, hitting the shells of material and um, shocking them up to produce X-rays, um, wherein we see the HCO plus emission, thus helping to confirm, to solidify that HCO plus is formed by X-rays and is clearly um, actively shaping the nebula um, in the past um, several centuries. So it's with work like this that we're hoping to much better characterize how NGC 7027 um, as a representation of other planetary nebula is evolving and what we can expect to find from other stars um, like our sun as they evolve. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I don't know, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. So the, the goal here, you know, we can put in your questions in the Q&A and we can take them right after the after the talks. And then if they last, if there are additional questions, we can um, discuss after everybody has finished speaking. I just, we have 59 participants currently online. I do not have a question right now in the Q&A. So we're gonna go um, to Will Armantrout next. So Jesse, if you can hand done, hand over sure. to Will. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Looks like I'm in my last slide, so I'll pop back to the beginning. Uh, it's good to be with you today. My name is Will Armantrout. Like Dave said, I'm a scientist at the Green Bank Observatory. And today I will give a little precursor uh, to some instrument development that we are hoping to undertake over the next few years. I have a poster on Friday at AAS, but it would be up all week if you want to stop by. So first off, uh, I'd like to convince you a little bit that we have good three millimeter performance in Green Bank. Uh, Argus 16, a pathfinding instrument for this current work, has been in routine observation over the past three plus years at the observatory. Um, and we have, at three millimeters, achieved our th theoretical beam shape and have a relatively flat gain curve. Uh, you can see that in the bottom right figure there where our aperture efficiency is pretty flat uh, according to that 2014 measurement. Pedro Salas will talk a little bit more about some GBT high frequency performance in a few talks through uh, the laser scanning system we've been installing at the observatory. Uh, but the story here is that we have at least a thousand hours of three millimeter telescope time every winter season, uh, depending on what tau measurements you want. If you want tau under 0.1, we have right around a thousand hours, tau under 0.2, 
double that, uh, we have over 2,000 hours of three millimeter time available. So over the past decade plus, we have built a pretty strong and vibrant US millimeter astronomy community in no large part because of the investment in ALMA. Uh, so ALMA has paid dividends, I think, scientifically. And that community has no way to obtain wide field sensitive maps of extended low surface brightness sources. Here's where large single dishes can come into play. Uh, so the Green Bank Observatory is proposing to design a 144 element three millimeter receiver operating between 74 and 116 gigahertz with excellent angular resolution for a single dish of 6.5 arc seconds to eight arc seconds. I've highlighted a few molecules here on the right, some of them Jesse just talked about, and many of these are the workhorses for detection of molecular gas and studies of star formation across the Milky Way. I've highlighted in yellow some of the most requested lines for the current Argus instrument. If your favorite line isn't up here, I apologize, uh, but this is just a sample to give you a feel for what will be possible with the new Argus 144 receiver. As a few sample science questions, we might think about star formation and gas cycling, how do filaments form and evolve, what's their mass accretion rate, and will all density fluctuations in any sort of structure form a core? How do those cores dissipate their turbulence? What are the sources of pressure in filaments and in other structures across the galaxy? And then on the larger scale, what is able to determine the distribution of dense gas across entire galaxies? And can we map this to the star formation rate of those galaxies? Um, the current Argus 16 receiver is on the right here. Uh, Andy Harris at University of Maryland is the PI for this receiver. The Argus 144 instrument will have on order 10 times the sensitivity of the Argus 16 receiver. It will have nine times the number of pixels as Argus 16, and we also are making improvements on uh, many pieces of the uh, of the instrument, from the sensitivity of the individual pixels uh, and more. This instrument really will be designed for wide field images. So on the left here, we have an image of Herschel infrared continuum. And then in the middle and right panels, we have 13 CL from Karma and NRO of Orion. Argus 144 would really enable mapping uh, this middle panel in just a few hours. So if you want one square degree on the sky and you're fine with one Kelvin RMS and one kilometer per second velocity resolution, Argus 144 will be able to make that square degree map in an hour. This same depth would require 10 hours with Argus 16 and around 35 hours with ALMA. Where are we right now for the Argus 144 instrument? Well, we're submitting a mid-scale pre-proposal tomorrow. Uh, and this grant would fund a design study for Argus 144, including a scalable data reduction pipeline for the current Argus 16 receiver. Uh, this design phase would then be followed by an implementation proposal with the National Science Foundation with final instrument commissioning somewhere around 2026. I would like to highlight here that community involvement will really be critical for a successful project here. And we have already thought about how we can map out uh, legacy surveys and make inclusive teams for whoever would like to be part of those legacy surveys in the future. Uh, so we will aggressively be seeking your involvement in the project if you would like to be involved. So with that, I am happy to take any questions you might have about this. I do not see any questions in the Q&A box yet. Let's see. Hold on. Uh, hey, Will, just to, to give you a heads up, um, Sarah Church was the actual PI of the original Stanford instrument. Um, Andy has taken over some instrument duties for Sarah when she 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 took on larger roles within Stanford. But anyway, so we might want to update that slide before we post that. Okay, um, there are no questions in the box. Our next speaker is Ryan Lynch. So if you could hand over to Ryan, Will.
All right, I'm attempting to share my screen. There we go. We can see it okay. Great. All right. Um, so yeah, my name is Ryan Lynch. I'm a staff scientist at the observatory and uh, I'm gonna be giving a poster at AAS next week on a large project that I'm involved in called the Green Bank North Celestial Cap Pulsar Survey. Many of you may have heard of this. It's been an ongoing uh, all sky pulsar survey at the GBT um, for some time now. So it is a low frequency survey uh, centered at 350 megahertz using relatively short um, dwell times or, or time spent on any given position of the sky of about two minutes. Um, and it is an all sky survey, at least all sky, uh, what we can actually see from the GBT. So it covers about 85% of the whole celestial sphere. Um, and this combination of factors makes it optimized for finding bright uh, nearby millisecond pulsars, as well as other types of uh, long period pulsars and transients as well. But the combination of observing um, both the galactic plane region, but especially outside the galactic plane um, at low frequency makes us preferentially uh, sensitive to kind of nearby MSPs um, with steep spectra compared to uh, pulsar surveys that might be carried out at higher frequencies. So the primary goal of the survey is to discover um, high timing precision millisecond pulsars that can be used to detect uh, low frequency gravitational waves uh, through projects like Nanograv and the International Pulsar Timing Array, which many of you will have heard about. Um, and then the other goals are the uh, study of fundamental physics, um, for example, through the discovery of relativistic um, binary pulsars and massive pulsars, um, exotic systems, like exotic binary systems with interesting evolutionary uh, tracks, um, and as well as just characterizing the low frequency uh, population of uh, pulsars and transients in the galaxy. So the survey began in 2009 and has been extremely successful. We've had 190 new pulsars discovered as part of the survey. Um, 33 of those are millisecond pulsars and 10 of them have been included, included in Nanograv or the IPTA. What I'm showing here is um, the expected correlation between pulsar timing residuals caused by gravitational wave background as a function of the separation between pulsars on the sky. As a quadrupolar signature, this is known as the Hellings and Downs curve. This is not the focus of my talk, but I wanted to, what I wanted to emphasize is that mapping this correlation pattern out, which is the real smoking gun of a gravitational wave detection using pulsar timing, requires pulsars that are spread over a wide variety of uh, angular separations. So an all sky survey like this really helps to fill in um, some of those wide angular separations um, when trying to do this type of detection. Um, some other highlights. Um, so the mass most massive neutron star known was discovered in the GBNCC survey. And then there was additional follow-up because it was happened to be a nanograph pulsar as well. Um, and so I think Cromartie led a paper about that. Um, just published last, year, published last year. We've also discovered uh, several other relativistic um, binary pulsars, double neutron star systems. Um, and then just the last year, we also published the uh, first detection of a fast radio burst um, in the survey, um, which was published by Emily Perrant in AppJ. Um, and I encourage you to go and uh, check that out um, to see about the implications for the low frequency FRB population. Um, so the post I'm going to be presenting is kind of the greatest hits and looking forward to uh, what the survey uh, holds in the future um, after this last 10 years. So we hope to complete the survey um, basically in this year, uh, depending on how much time we get for it, um, perhaps uh, leading into 2022, but we're really wrapping up this, this uh, large decade long survey at the GBT. Um, we do plan to reprocess the data with improved RFI mitigation and candidate classification. One of the great things about a survey like this is that you basically have an archival high time and high frequency resolution snapshot of the sky, and you can go back and apply new data reduction techniques and algorithms to make new discoveries. And this has been done repeatedly in pulsar surveys and has been very successful for finding more and more types of pulsars. Um, so far, we've uh, only published 72 timing solutions, but there's uh, more in the works and more to go. And I really want to emphasize that doing the survey is just one and really the first step towards achieving the scientific potential of the survey. To really get the most out of it, it's absolutely critical that you follow up these new discoveries, 
for about a year minimum in order to get pulsar timing solutions, because that's where we really learn about the physical characteristics of the systems and the detailed properties of the pulsars. It's only after that that we can do things like measure uh, pulsar masses and confirm the systems are in relativistic binaries, um, as well as to understand interesting phenomena like nulling and other kind of long time scale behavior. So there's uh, uh, follow up timing observations are just absolutely critical. Um, we are following up some select sources with the CHIME uh, telescope in uh, Canada. Um, this is good for some of the sources that are um, at appropriate declination ranges, and that, that uh, definitely helps to give us um, a high cadence observations of some of the pulsars. But it's not quite as sensitive as the GBT. So we really still need a sensitive telescope like the GBT to follow them up. And uh, this data will eventually be arc ingested into the new Green Bank Data Archive, which will make it easier for anyone to access. So I encourage people who are interested to stop by my first to learn, learn more. And I also just want to highlight my uh, summer student, Lulu Ghazi's poster as well. Um, she was looking into potential um, next generation surveys for the GBT as a successor to the GBNCC. And so I encourage people to stop by her poster as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and it's good to hear that the data will be ingested into the, our new archive for long, long use for this um, big data set. I don't have a question in the Q&A. Um, I guess it'd be interesting if somebody from the observatory is a participant, please submit a question to the Q&A, make sure that works. As a panelist, I don't think I can submit questions there. I couldn't actually, I could just see the questions and answer them. So it'd be nice if somebody, would just submit a question if nothing else to say hi in the Q. Oh, we got something in the Q&A. So, okay, test question from Karen Masters. Thank you, Karen. Okay, it works. <laughs> um, just wanted to make sure. So we'll have opportunity after all the speakers to have um, some general questions and discussion. Our next speech speaker is Pedro Salas. And so we're gonna hand over to him. Sorry. Hello everyone, I'm Pedro Salas, a postdoc at the Green Bank Observatory. And today I wanted to share with you a sneak peek of the poster we will be presenting next week during the AAAS about the Laser Antenna Surface Scanning Instrument, or LASI for short. So the GVT is the largest uh, single dish telescope operating at three millimeter wavelength. And this makes it uh, an excellent complement to other uh, telescopes operating at this wavelength, such as ALMA or NUEMA, uh, like Will and Jesse said. And operations at this wavelength are possible thanks to the fact that this primary reflector, this 100 meter primary reflector, is actually composed of roughly 2000 panels, which can be moved in real time using 2200 actuators. This is really cool and really useful because it Thanks to this, the telescope has an almost flat gain curve with elevation. Thanks to the work of the observatory staff throughout the years, uh, the effects of gravity on the shape of the primary are very well understood. And this means that once you have a well set surface, you can slow in elevation and the gain of the telescope will not change as is shown here on this right curve, on this right plot on the green curve. Uh, where we're showing the relative efficiency as a function of elevation and how it has improved over the years. This leaves weather effects as the major source of uh, surface error uh, when observing at these frequencies. This can be routinely corrected uh, under benign weather conditions using out-of-focus holography. But when the weather is changing quickly, uh, meaning that the surface is also changing uh, quickly, out of focus holography is not the best method for uh, measuring this deformation since it takes uh, more than 14 minutes to obtain the data necessary to measure the deformations. For this reason, the observatory has been investigating uh, using a commercial off the shelf terrestrial laser scanner to measure these deformations. This is the laser antenna surface scanning instrument, basically a Leica scan station P50 installed close to the telescope focus from where it scans the primary reflector and measures the formations, which can then be corrected using the active surface. This is a diagram showing where the scanner is installed. From there, you can see the whole primary reflector of the telescope. 
And this is how the weatherproof housing for the scanner looks like. This is on top, from the top of the receiver cabin. And once the scanner is operational, these doors open and the scanner can basically map the whole primary reflector. And there's also a hinge that enables it to free float so that we can scan the surface at any elevation. This is an example of how the process data looks like on the top. We have these two maps of the surface. And you may notice this very funky triangular pattern that is not actually a surface of the telescope, but that's the signature of the scanner. We also have these white pixels uh, on the surface of the telescope that's just flag data. And if you're interested in knowing a bit more about the masking and flagging of the data, I encourage you to go and visit uh, Max Mason's poster during the OAS. And what we do to get rid of this uh, funky pattern is basically take difference between scans and we obtain then a map of the actual surface. In this case, we use the active surface to reproduce an oblique trefoil deformation, which looks like this clover leaf pattern we see here. From this uh, kind of data, we have um, tried to see how the, how the instrument will work. Uh, when it's uh, actually correcting for these deformations. And we estimate that it will be able to deliver a surface error of roughly 260 microns uh, uh, day or night, which is slightly worse than what uh, autofocus holography can do currently, which reaches roughly 230 microns. But it's uh, better than the current, uh, the average conditions we can reach during the day, which are roughly 350 microns. So as a summary, the observatory is developing the LASI to enable efficient three millimeter observations using a commercial off the shelf terrestrial laser scanner. We have had this instrument for two years and based on the experiments we have been able to conduct, we know that we can measure the formations uh, of roughly 60 microns over the 100 meter primary reflector. And from this, we estimate that we will be able to correct the surface down to a surface error of 260 microns RMS. We see that the data quality is, between, is consistent between day and night, so we should be able to do this during the day. And we're hoping to start commissioning this winter. Thank you very much for your attention and for stopping by today. Thank you, Pedro. We do have a question on, on your talk, and the question is, um, why did we go with the laser scanner in, instead of using photogrammetry or phonogrammetry, like you camera techniques? Um, do you know, or do you want I, to say something on that? <laughs> um, well, I, I wasn't there when the when photogrammetry was in place, but my guess is mainly that uh, it could be just that photogrammetry requires targets, and uh, yeah, that you will need to put these targets uh, actively, and also you need to to use a camera, and maybe it was too complex to to assign a, a system to automatically. Uh, take these pictures with the scanner, you basically don't have to worry about it because that's already uh, built for you. But yeah, honestly, I, I don't know the exact answer, sorry. Yeah, there are different techniques. I know historically at the observatory, somebody, we got a scanner that test out and it was shown to work pretty well. And so we had pers we pursued that with the proposal and they uh, we were given fund funding to do that, but uh, other people have asked why we chose the scanner versus the other techniques, and I'm not in a position to answer uh, based mm -hmm. on technology to actually know. I, mean, I think there are different merits to different techniques. Um, okay, we have a question about snow and ice on the GVT. How does snow and ice on the GVT affect LASI? <laughs> um, well, they don't, they should not affect directly LASI in terms of, uh, they should not affect the instrument since it's uh, in this weatherproof housing. But uh, obviously, obviously, if the surface of the telescope is covered in ice uh, or with snow, you cannot, uh, you cannot do high frequency observations. Um, the one of the things that I remember Tony Minter uh, mentioning was that he would be really interested in using LASI to see uh, if there's still snow or ice on the surface. So we don't have to, to look at it uh, from afar and we can have a 
a much more accurate measurement of how much ice is left on the surface. That would be an interesting use of Lassie, yeah. Because, yeah, as Pedro says, once we get the snow and ice on the dip, we see a, a huge drop in efficiency, aperture efficiency at high frequency, and we basically track the sun to melt, melt it off, which can take a while. Um, okay, I'm gonna open it up to general questions. Ryan already asked a question that came in during another talk and that people I think can see it in the Q&A or maybe they can't, but they were, the question was what frequencies are being scanned for FRBs? And Ryan answered the, the center frequency of the survey was 350 megahertz. Um, and they have 100 megahertz of bandwidth. And then there was a question asking if Argus one, oh, there's a question, <laughs> they answered it. Argus 144 was similar to the Ohio State Telescope um, in downtown Columbus. Um, and um, Jesse and Will answered that. Well, there is a radio telescope, but anyway, um, so that, but the radio telescope works at much longer wavelengths than the OSU telescope, which is famous, known as a big ear for the wow signal way back. I forget when that was a SETI, a SETI signal um, back in, in the seventies, basically. And let's see, any other questions? I think that are all the questions that have come in today. Um, we did have 65 people participate. Um, what time is it now? We have a, a couple minutes. If, if anybody else wants to submit any other questions, we can, we can hang on here for a couple minutes. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for um, chiming in today. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Okay. I just did a quick search. It looks like the big ear was decommissioned. Yeah, I don't think it, yeah, it's been a, yeah. That was an interesting to do the comparison to Argus 144, but it was a big dish. I mean, a flat reflector, it was a hundred meters by whatever, 30 meters or something like that. Okay, well, seeing no more questions, we're gonna go ahead and, um, in this um, community Zoom for the day. And so thank you very much. We plan on continuing these Zoom meetings every two weeks. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs>